Thanks for joining me on my channel again. Today I've got another interesting guest. I think they're all interesting. I think you'll find this guest is interesting. His name is Reiner de Blois. I just confirmed that pronunciation with him. He is Dutch. We're going to discuss several interesting factors, issues related to Bible translation. The leading one for this video is actually his experience in doing a revision of the Dutch King James equivalent, which was the Staten Vertaling of 1637. There's actually something of a Staten Vertaling only movement that has built ties with the King James only movement in the U.S. And I want to talk through his experiences there. I also want to ask him about his work with the NIDA Institute and a special paper he's done on artificial intelligence. So, uh, Brother Du Bois, I just want to ask you to start out with what are some of the institutions that our, my viewers might know about that you've served in and end with the NIDA Institute and tell us about it? Okay, well, I started as a missionary Bible translation, translator in Nigeria in uh, 1981. Uh, I was working at that time for the Netherlands Reformed Congregations. That's a small Reformed denomination in the Netherlands. You find them in the U.S. as well and in Canada, in small small groups. And they were doing mission work in Nigeria. And they already had a New Testament, and I was asked to put a team together to do the translation of the Old Testament, first in one of the dialects and later on also in two additional dialects. So I was there for several years with my family, and then we left back for the Netherlands in uh, 1990, and then I joined the United Bible Societies, first as an honorary translation advisor and later as a translation consultant. I started working with projects in several countries in Africa, first in Guinea and West Africa, and later in Tanzania in, in East Africa. Um, in 2019, I joined the American Bible Society. There was an opening there, and I became the director of the NIDA Institute. I kept working with translation projects kind of part-time, but our focus has uh, shifted a little bit towards support for Bible translation in a broader sense. We support the entire Bible translation movement. Mostly the different Bible societies that are members of the United Bible Societies Fellowship but we also work very closely with other agencies. And we are trying to create resources for Bible translators and also kind of offer them training in certain areas so that they will be better equipped to do their work. I support some missionary friends of mine that I used to work with at Lagos in doing a similar work at Wycliffe. I have many friends who work for Bibles International. I have a friend who was a lawyer at the American Bible Society for some time. Uh, I support the work of Bible translation from my own little spot in American Protestantism. Don't you have some relationship with Puritan Reform Theological Seminary and Joel Beakey, whom I've also interviewed? Yes, I do, actually. A couple of years ago, I was uh, appointed as an adjunct professor there. So occasionally I give some lectures. I've been given lectures in Hebrew semantics, which is the area that I've specialized in. And actually, currently I'm teaching a course on uh, issues in linguistics, kind of the relation between linguistics and theology, how linguistics can help theologians get a better understanding of the Bible. Wow. Is any of that material available in written form or in lectures anywhere online? Well, this is a new course, and I just started working on it, and I taught my first lecture uh, yesterday, which was nice. I really enjoyed it. And yeah, I suppose that in due course, something will be done with those lectures. But I feel I need a little bit more time to work it all out and, and to get ready. This is my sure. I, sometimes I have envied uh, classroom professors because a lot of the books that I read seem to be the fruit of years of class lectures, and they get the benefit of a lot of editing from students who will ask this or that question that the uh, right. professors didn't think to ask. Whereas my yeah. teaching has tended to be online, and I, I don't tend to get that kind of interaction. I gather, though, that you weren't doing that in person. I'm doing this in person. Yes, I, I live pretty close to PRTS, so I, I can go there face-to-face. -face. Although some of the students are actually online, but about half of them are, are there in the classroom. Okay, that's wonderful. You are definitely qualified to talk about the topics that we'll discuss today. I want to ask you then, what was your role in any revision work on the Staten Vertaling? When did that happen in the timeline of your life and ministry that you described to me? 
Yeah, that is interesting. I, I'm from the NRC originally. That's the church denomination where I was raised. And there they were active users of the Spatum Darling and they were resisting any efforts to revise it or change it or replace it. Um, meanwhile, I was working for the United Bible Societies doing, well, working with translators in different parts of the world, uh, several languages, different places. But still, at the same time, I felt a burden for the people in my own church because I knew that many of them were struggling with the Spaten Vertalen. And then when an effort was launched in the Netherlands to do a revision of the Spaten Vertaling, I really thought it would be great if I could participate. You know, it's great to serve people all over the world, but it's also nice to serve your own church, right? Your own denomination, your own people. And uh, so I kind of volunteered to become part of that. I had a meeting with the, the board and yeah, they, they found that was, that was a good idea. So I joined them as an advisor, as a consultant, kind of on, on a personal, personal basis. I mean, it had nothing to do with my work. It was just a volunteer thing that I did on the site. Although I must say that in due course, that responsibility grew and grew and grew. Grew and grew, right. Yeah. Now, t can, have you, please tell our viewers, what was it that led you as clearly, you know, a native Dutch speaker to believe that the Staten Vertaling was causing trouble or difficulty for fellow members of your church, a Bible preaching church, a gospel believing church? very much like the churches that are around me now, um, what evidence did you have that this 1637, you know, King James equivalent was in need of revision? Well, let me give you an example. There is just one word in Dutch. That's the word slecht. And in contemporary Dutch, that means bad, right? But in the time of the Statenvertaling, that word was still common, but had a different sense. It, it, it meant something like, to be simple-minded, to be not too intelligent, right? So there is this text in, um, where is it? I think it's in Proverbs somewhere, and it says, who is in the state of Adam slecht, let him come to me. And it actually meant that people who lacked wisdom should come to the source of wisdom and obtain wisdom, right? That's what it meant. But since in the course of the centuries, the word slecht had taken on the meaning of bad, it was very often used in the churches that I attended, where a preacher would come, who is a sinner, who is slecht, he come to me. And that's still an appropriate application, but it's not a translation of that particular text, right? Of course, all who feel their sins should come to the Lord. There's no doubt about it, but that's not what the text said in that particular verse. And that's, that's just one, one example. There are other cases that to be a stumbling block it's quite often in the when, when Lord Jesus talks to his disciples and the crowds, he talks about not becoming a stumbling block. Woe to those who become a stumbling block, proskoma, or some of those Greek words. Uh, that word had been translated by a verb, sich uh, in Dutch. And in due course, that word took on the meaning of to become irritated. So then all of a sudden people are listening to the text talking about people feeling irritated about something, whereas it talks about really something almost entirely different in the text. So if you brought those particular examples, and maybe you have very specific yes. anecdotes in mind, I'd love to hear the more specific, the better, the more concrete, the better. When you took those specific examples of what I on my channel call false friends, but in Dutch, words whose senses have changed over time, they haven't dropped out of the language, they're still there but they're used differently. And they're used differently in such a way that people don't realize they're misunderstanding. When you present that to people, what did they say back to you if they were skeptical of this whole revision idea? Well, if you talk to individuals, most of them would agree that there is a problem, right? It's not the individuals that are the stumbling block. It was mostly the church leaders that were kind of afraid of all the potential division that would happen, you know, that's the main reason why they would not be on board. But if you would talk to some of those pastors individually, they say, yes, of course you are right. But you know, we cannot really afford to do that. It would create division, would create trouble. So let's not do it. And there was also the idea that people would say that, okay, well, this is the word of God. It, if you want to research how a computer works, you know, you're not afraid to take big book 
and study. So if this is the Bible, why don't you just open a commentary and it will tell you everything you need to know. And well, I was way more concerned, not about the people who are very much inclined to study, but just the people in the streets who are reading the Bible and want to get food out of it and nourishment who are not in a position to go and open commentaries and study. And I think we feel it. We owe it to them as the church to make sure that God's word comes to them, you know, the way it is intended to be understood. And I found out in those days that there's a lot of what I would call bibliolatry in those days. And it's, it's still there all over the place where, where people are going to look at the certain translation as an instance of the word of God itself without realizing that it's a translation. And if language changes, translations need to follow the change in the language. None of what you're saying will be new to anyone who has watched this channel for any length of time. This is exactly what we're facing with the King James Version. Did you hear people say you're criticizing the Stockton Vertalen when you would raise difficulties like this? Sure. And you know, you sometimes met people who are really genuinely loving God's word, right? And they actually felt hurt by some of those things. And that's the painful thing about it. Of course, you don't want to hurt anybody. You want to speak to people in love. But still, if you have this conviction, you know, that this problem is there, you also need to work with those those people. So some people were really genuinely shocked. And some people, they played a political game. I mean, there were even people saying that you are doing the work of Satan simply because they were afraid of the division that was going to happen. Well, you know, that's not very nice to hear. Of course, I was able to give it a place, but uh, still, these things, they do hurt. Right, right. Yeah, I, I hear that at least once a week. I would say usually a little more. Um, I I constantly get a comment on this channel that just says, Yea, hath God said, you know, which is the King James way of uh, putting what Satan said in the garden, as if the revision of a translation, which is exactly what the King James translators themselves were doing, as if that in itself is questioning God's word. And I don't know the history of the Stottenver Tolling exceptionally well. If it came along in 1637, however, and from my knowledge, Protestantism in the Netherlands is older than that, is the Stottenver Tolling itself a revision of a previous translation? It's not a revision. Uh, there were some translations uh, before that, that's, yeah, even almost from the time that, that Luther created his, his German translation of the Bible. So there is an old uh, translation of the Luther Bible into the Netherlands that actually was very much beloved by by the people in, in the churches, uh, the so-called Desas Bible. Um, so that was very Lutheran in, in, in many ways. And of course, the Netherlands was more Calvinistic in its orientation. And uh, But yeah, the moment... You know, the thing is too that the Desas Bible was created during a time of enormous persecution. I mean, the Spanish were in charge in the Netherlands, and they were persecuting all the, the Protestants. So in those days, the Bible becomes, you know, very dear to the hearts of people. They get their comfort out of, out of that. But then when the time of persecution was, was over and the Dutch were successful in their rebellion against the Spanish and the, the Dutch church became stronger and well-formed. They had their first synod in 1618, 1619. And then they discussed the, yeah, the condition of the, of the existing translation and they had some difficulty with it. I mean, it was not a very good translation. Of course, there were very different dialects in the, in the Netherlands and the dialects that they had chosen were not always the most appropriate ones. So they felt that the time had come to work together as a church and to to create this new translation. So that decision was made in 1618 and 1619 during that, that synod. So then they started working. So yeah, you can imagine before the translation to be finished, it takes quite a bit of time. So 1637 is not so, not so strange. Of course, the King James Bible was actually a revision of the Bishop's Bible. But the start of Redaling was actually a very new translation. Although, although many people were kind of objecting against this new Bible coming out. And that's something that we hear these days as well, you know. And uh, people felt that that existing translation, the Desas Bible, was very dear to them. <clears throat> and they did not like to see many changes. So it's also quite obvious that the Staten Vertaling, 
that the people working on that, they try to respect the disaster Bible as much as they can. Right. Talk to me about the Staten Vertaling only movement, you know, for lack of a better term. I've encountered it online. I've seen that the Trinitarian Bible Society, who I think is doing some real good around the world, you know, I often think about what Paul said, even if they preach Christ of contention, I still rejoice that Christ is being preached. Even if they're translating the TR because that because of reasons I think are bad, they're still translating the Bible into the language of people and getting it out to people and they're evangelizing. I'm glad for that. I've seen that the Trinitarian Bible Society, which of course is an English-speaking organization, has a link up with a Dutch organization whose name I, I don't know. But when I read their website, I read their materials, I realized this is the same viewpoint. Can you talk to me about the Staten Vertaling only movement and what is it called in, in Dutch? Well, there's a group, they call themselves the Reformed Bible Society. And the, they are the ones that are yeah, working together with the, the TBS in English speaking areas. And they have more or less the same, the same point of view. I would say that the churches in the Netherlands that support TBS are usually more on, more conservative than those who support the TBS. I think that's a bit of a wider, a wider group, but, uh, yeah, they are, they are there and they're very active and, uh, but you see, it, it's kind of the same thing uh, when the Good News Bible came out in the Netherlands. Of course, they wrote publications about it and, and also when other translations came. And they're usually it's very strongly against any change. You can see now that these days some of the more conservative churches, they've become a little worried about the start of the Towning. And they're looking for ways to make the start of the Towning a little bit more accessible. And they're actually struggling with the Reformed Bible Society to find a solution. And the Reformed Bible Society is not very willing to change many things. Like one of the things that is also a problem in the Netherlands is the use of cases, like the genitive and the dative cases. We used to have a dated case system in the 1600s, but it has completely disappeared. But still, many of those constructions are still in the start of Reforming, and they have become quite ambiguous in, in many cases. But still, the problem is the moment you break them open, you have to add a certain level of interpretation because a genitive form is not necessarily a form of possession. You cannot always change it with, sometimes you say it is possession, sometimes it can also mean a purpose or uh, a benefactor, all those things. Yeah, you have to deal with those things. Yeah, and that that's a big deal for, for many. And I can, I can understand that. Sometimes like Romans, it is hard to say, the righteousness of God is God the subject, is God the object. It's not always clear. Yeah. You know, the, this your situation is so parallel. I, I mean, I just, I'm understanding everything you're saying. Clearly, you're understanding everything I'm saying. Reminds me of the time that I was interviewed by John McWhorter, who was a major linguistics hero of mine, and he read my book. And as an atheist, he said something to me that was really meaningful. He said, Mark, I get it. I understand your book because he had a parallel project with Shakespeare. You know, for him, the revision of Shakespeare, in order to bring it to the masses and make it accessible, you know, was something of a religious postulate, the way the Bible is for us. You've had a similar experience. I wonder, I didn't prepare you for this question, but have you done any reflecting on the, to me, uh, what's the word I want? The theodicy question, in a way. Why would the Lord give us this situation where this sort of thing seems to get repeated. I mean, it goes back at least to the Vulgate where Jerome and Augustine are riding back and forth and there's this riot over the word gourd and Jonah being, you know, revised. And then I'd like to say, I, I think it goes back further because the very name of the Septuagint comes from this legend, which can't possibly be true, that 70 different translators went into 70 different rooms, translated the entire Old Testament and came out with exactly the same text. In other words, they're talking about the Septuagint as if it were inspired. And that's exactly the way that the King James gets talked about. I have to imagine that's the way the Staten Vertelling gets talked about. Why would the Lord allow this? Have you given some reflection to that question? Well, I have seen it in other parts of the world as well. Like, for instance, in, in places where they speak Swahili. There is an old Swahili Union Bible that has been around for a long time. It is very dear to the, to the people, but it's a extremely literal, extremely literal, and sometimes almost impossible to understand. So when the local Bible societies, they produced a, a more of a contemporary language version, you know, they thought it would really 
be a success, but many of the churches, they are strongly against it. They don't like it, especially the pastors. And there are even cases I have, to, and I've heard that from the mouth of some, some pastors that they say, hey, you know, it's our responsibility to explain the Bible text to the people in our congrega congregation. I mean, this Bible comes around and actually do, does our work for us. Well, the, those are a bit extreme cases, but those, those sentiments are certainly there as well. Yeah, I've wondered over time, uh, as you were talking about um, the situation in the, in the Netherlands, and as you just described the Swahili pastors, I would say there is some of that in the King James only movement in the United States and around the world. There is some of pastors being skeptical of a revision because they think it'll cause division. I think there is some of this pastors thinking, well, if people can read a translation that they can readily understand, then I'm out of a job. I, I never hear anyone actually say that. That's just kind of something you pick up, you know, so, read between the lines. I try not to conclude that about any individual. Um, so there are some ways in which the situation you described is not parallel. My judgment would be uh, the pastors in the United States are not so much afraid of division per se as destruction of their institutions, whether churches or schools. And so I have felt that I need to reach the lay people. And that, that means, uh, that raises another question for you. This is a perennial problem, yeah. right? And it's a perennial problem, not just for English speakers. It's hitting us now in multiple cult cultures because of the Protestant Reformation, right? A around the same time, we had many European Bibles created. And around now, by now, pretty well all of them, you know, my knowledge of Dutch and German and French and Portuguese and Italian is not all fantastic, but I actually do use translations in all those languages. Uh, I, I still have a copy of Bible Works where I have all those translations listed out, and I'll use them for uh, interpretation projects sometimes. We're coming to the place where they're all, I think, sufficiently unintelligible that they call for revision, and yet we've got movements of folks who are uh, concerned about that. I'm wondering, what can I, what can we possibly do to steward the church's trust in our good Bible translations and to try to uh, inoculate the church against this error in the future, lest we have an ESV-only movement in the year, you know, 20, who knows what, in 100 years or something like that? What can we do to prepare against that eventuality? Have you given some thought to that? Well, a little bit. And actually, like I told you earlier, I mean, I'm teaching this course on linguistics and theology. And I think this is one of the things that are really necessary. People have, even theologians, they have to learn a bit of linguistics. Just the basics, not very deep, not very complicated, but some basic linguistic principles. And one of the things is, is language change. And the other thing is that consistency is not always the best option. You know, you cannot always translate one biblical term in the same way all over a text. You don't always do justice to the, to the word of God. And uh, so I think those are two important things. People think that the literal translation is always the best translation. That is kind of a thought because, yeah, it sounds so good. We want to stay close to the word of God, right? But you don't always stay close to the word by translating literally. Sometimes you can actually become very far from what the Lord is actually trying to say to us. So, yeah, it is education. And I think if linguistics would be introduced in many of the seminaries, I think it would help. I have to agree with you there. And in fact, my time at Logos, and I've, I've been here eight years now. I'm actually standing in our offices right now, kind of using my lunch break to do this conversation for our personal channel and testing out a new studio that we're trying to put together here for some future video work. Anyway... Um, I've realized that a big push in my own work here has been that very thing. You know, we provide a lot of great Hebrew and Greek tools to pastors and to other Bible nerds that are part of our constituency, our core market. And, and I use those tools myself all of the time. But I started to reflect, I, I started to realize a lot, I, I'm going to have to say the great majority of uses of Greek and Hebrew that I've heard in the pulpit, often from otherwise excellent preachers who really are good Bible interpreters, is at least a little bit technically wrong and often at, at best kind of just redundant. They're only just saying what the English Bible translation in their hearer's laps already says. So I realized that work of teaching linguistics has to be done. And I have wondered 
if in fact a lot of pastors out there are, I'm told, not even using their Greek and Hebrew. And at Lagos, you know, we kind of look down on that. We give these tools out to people because we value them. Yeah. But if a lot of preachers are taking two years of Greek and um, a year of Hebrew and then forgetting it all, I wonder if they'd be better served having some linguistics courses that are focused on leading to the, them to the place where they can um, catch yeah. those exegetical fallacies, where they can understand the kinds of things that James Barr and Moises Silva talk about. I wonder if you've given thought to that. What would the ideal, you know, education, not, not ideal, what, would, what could really be possible here in education of pastors? What do you think? Well, you know, now if people learn Hebrew at the seminary, there's a lot of focus on morphology. You learn those paradigms, you know, and you have to, you, you focus a lot on, on the nuts and bolts of the language. And that's not always very helpful, I think. Because, you know, this is information you can find on your computer now. You click on a word, a Hebrew verb, it'll tell you exactly, you know, this is a call, this is a PL, the perfect, and, and so on. People have done all that work for you. So rather than learning all those strong verbs and weak verbs and, and everything, it would be much better to focus on discourse structure that tells you, you know, the, the, the structure of the text itself. And that actually can be very, very, very enlightening. Um, and semantics. Semantics is, of course, that's my, my little baby. I mean, that's my specialization. I think semantics is incredibly important. What is the text actually saying, right? And then also from the, the worldview of the speakers of the language, why did they use that word? How did it fit within their view of, of the world? Because that's not necessarily the way it fits in our worldview. So there are certain terms that we as Westerners are struggling with because the concepts simply doesn't exist. Let me, can I give you an example? The word chesed. The word chesed is, of course, a word that's very well-known and very popular, and people do lots of studies about that. Well, Western translations are really struggling with it. Um, if you look at RSV, NIV, it's mostly we talk about status, love, love, and, and things like that. And actually... If you really study the word in context, and, and I, have, I have done that, I have found out that it has very little to do with love, but very much more to do with, with the loyalty, with a commitment towards the relationship. And we Westerners are so individual, individualistic that we cannot understand anymore what it means to be part of a community and to have responsibilities to the other people in the community. And I've worked in Africa for many years, and I found out that Africans, they understand the concept of chesed perfectly. They know exactly what it means and how it functions. There are certain things that being part of the community, you know, you, you, you have to do to be a worthy member of that community. I gave an example in one of my classes. I was teaching actually at PRTS, and I had several people in my group. Some were Dutch, Americans, and some people from Africa, from Asia as well. So, and I said, let me give you an example. Suppose you hear today that your brother-in-law has done something very bad. He has stolen, he has killed somebody, whatever. What would you do? And the Dutch person stood up and he said, I would take my phone and I would call the police right away. The African looked at him and said, are you crazy? He's your brother-in-law. I mean, there are certain things, certain loyalties that are very well understood by people in more rural cultures, but that we have completely lost. And actually, Chesed is, is way more part of that. It's the commitment towards doing right to people. And it's also for the Lord. When the Lord shows his Chesed to us, it's simply because of the covenant. He is showing his commitment to the covenant. He has promised, if you keep my covenant, I will be your God, and you will be my people. And then the great thing is that even if we break our part of the covenant, if we are not loyal as humans, which we are not, then God is so faithful that he even continues with his commitment, in spite of the fact that we break the chesed all day long. Right. That's so wonderful. I mean, the book of Ruth becomes almost unintelligible to modern Westerners because of that. I mean, chesed is one of the key words used there. And yep. to kind of bring that really beautiful uh, reflection on that wonderful word back to the topic a little bit. I would like to see the average pastor have some facility 
in just looking at the way a given word is used, especially if it's used a sufficient number of times in the Hebrew Bible or the Greek New Testament. And they could feasibly do this even with very weak Greek or Hebrew knowledge, but with the available software tools. And they, I'd like to see them have some ability to do what I would maybe call lexicography. Right. We all do it intuitively our entire lives. We catch the meaning of words by the way that they're used. But suddenly when we get to the Bible, pastors, we all, you know, the average Christian tend to assume there's some special definite technical meaning here, and I've got to go look it up, and now that meaning occurs everywhere I look. That just isn't the case. For me, it's semantics, pragmatics, and lexicography, where my mind is kind of constantly going around those three. I haven't found, I, I'm still kind of uh, on the fence about discourse analysis, although in the Hebrew Bible, I'm more inclined to see the value because in narrative structures, it feels yep. to me like it's yielding more insight. Yep. But all those concepts that we've just talked about, technical terms and linguistics, seem to me to be, if I have to pit them against one another, more valuable than the grammar translation method instruction of Greek and Hebrew. I'm almost yeah. afraid to say that out loud in the Logos offices of all places. But year after year, I feel I'm coming more and more to the willingness to say that. Well, the reason that Locos, the, the fact that Locos is there actually, you know, makes it possible for students to say, okay, let me get an information straight from Logos and not learn it off the top of my head, you know? So it, it's a good thing. Yeah. Logos so, well, needed. actually, the, uh, in defense of Logos, because I, I'm here admitting that I'm not happy with the way all of our users use our software. Sometimes I, I cringe, um, but I still, I stay at it because I don't think it's the software's fault. Actually, the Bible word study in Logos is what I have found to uh, be the best tool available for yeah. doing your own lexicography because it, it breaks down the usage for you. It gives you access. You know, I'm, I'm mainly spending my time in Greek. It's giving me access to the Septuagint, easy access. It doesn't, it's not an extra step. I, it sends me out to Josephus and the Apostolic Fathers. Basically, it's expanding the, the, the synchronic usage you know, uh, what's the word I want? Uh, the, the breadth, the synchronic usage. Maybe I should say the depth because we're looking at one spot on the timeline. I find that to be really useful, but I also find most people don't seem to, to, to be able to do that work. One way I know that is when we discuss English and kind of back to the King James again. I, I do feel that it's amazing to me the creation of God in language. Like, I just marvel at it. I absolutely love language and linguistics. It's so amazing to me that people can master incredible subtleties, like the difference between well and whelp, you know, in a conversation. These, in a way, are discourse markers. And, and yet, though they can produce, generate grammatical sentences of incredible nuance and sophistication, they can't describe them. So when I come along to describe what I know they know at some level in their brains, I know they know that archaisms exist in the King James, and yet they tell me, I, I heard it again today, they don't exist at all. There are no archaic words in the King James Version. Um, I, I'm again asking the question, why would the Lord put us in a situation where this knowledge has to be so technical? I'm not blaming the Lord. I'm asking, what can we do about it? And I think you have given some excellent advice and counsel, and you've invested yourself in it. And I've talked too long. This is so fascinating what you're telling me. Let's move to the, unless you have another comment, I see in your face you do. No, not right now. Go okay. Ahead. Let me hear about that AI paper. You just mentioned it to me in a conversation we had some time ago. Uh, we were connected by Joost Tsech, who has also been on this channel, and it was a fun conversation. Um, uh, you mentioned you did an AI paper, and I have no idea about it. You just tell us about that. Well, together with our colleagues at SIL, we are working on a book on quality in translation. And that's the Summer Institute of Linguistics, which is that's generally right. affiliated with yes. Wycliffe Bible Translators. Yes. And this book will be published in the course of this year by Wittfenstock. Um, I'm one of the editors of the book, but I'm also co-author of one of the articles, together with a number of colleagues from Canada, Larry Hayashi, Paul Unger, and Matt Merritt. So you're writing a little bit about, about AI, because, of course, AI is a big thing everywhere, but also in Bible translation. And there's a big movement in Bible translation to speed up the work 
worldwide. And now we have these people who are coming with a number to say there's about 2,000 languages left. Let's see what we can do to make sure that they have a Bible as soon as possible. So, and then people start thinking of AI. What if we would create the draft of the Bible or parts of the Bible in all the remaining languages using AI? Is that possible? And there's a lot of money being invested in that. There are many people doing all kinds of research with a lot of optimism. And there are certain areas where I think we could do a lot of great things, but there are also areas where I think it is not, uh, we have to be very careful. Like for instance, um, a good Bible translation has three elements in it, I believe. That's kind of my personal belief. There is something called immersion, and there is something what I would call illumination, and there's something that I would call incarnation. Immersion means that a Bible translator should have the opportunity to immerse themselves in the biblical text, to study the text in a language that they're comfortable with, and they get as deep part of depth that you were referring to a minute ago in the text as possible to make it their own, so to speak. And then there's the moment that they actually uh, negotiate you know, all that information in their head and they, they translate it, they, they, they look for alternatives. And that process, I think, is, is holy ground. The moment that translator or a team of translators is there praying for the Lord to help them find the right equivalents, you know, in order to put them on paper for their uh, constituents. But I believe that is, I call it illumination because I believe that's impossible to do that without the help of the Holy Spirit. And then I use incarnation in the sense that Bible translation shouldn't be a clone of the original. I believe that the Lord working through faithful Christians, well-trained people in that language will give them the right words to, so that that translation will become the new instance of, of the word of God for that particular community. Uh, those three elements are important. And I think if we allow a computer to generate the first draft of a language, already so many Bridges have been passed. So many decisions have been made that you cannot rebuild that same quality of process. So I think that's an area where I believe that AI has to be very, 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 very well applied in a very reticent way. But there are certain areas where AI can do great things. Like what I said about immersion. I am kind of working with colleagues, kind of philosophizing about the system that would actually help prepare Bible translators to do a good job. Like there are so many resources out there. There's commentaries, there's all kinds of background information and things like that. But the way it is now, a translator has to look for information. You actually have to go to Logos and you have to type in, you know, a certain verse that you're working on or a certain word that you're researching. And uh, that is actually too bad because Logos doesn't know what the translator knows. Not yet, anyway. Logos doesn't know what information the translator needs. They don't know where the translator lives, what the climate is, uh, the geography of their area. I'm kind of thinking of a system where AI would actually get to know the translator, get to know what they know, where they live, what they have translated already, and kind of the moment they embark on the translation of a certain passage, that AI will come to their rescue and say, hey, as a co-pilot, it would be good to look at this. And what about this? Did you check out this? So that the translators are properly prepared. And then they can start translating. And then AI will stop for a while. And then when the translation is back on paper, the AI can come back in again and say, hey, you have used this word here, but the same Hebrew word is found there. And you didn't translate it in the same way. Um, what if you would use the same word? Of course, it wouldn't force a translator to do that because you should be very careful by enforcing that. But it would look at, at, at the quality of the books. It would look at the consistency. It would look at, you know, certain decisions that were made and, and kind of question some of them wherever necessary. So I believe it's like a sandwich. AI can help at the beginning. AI can help at the end. But there is a moment right in the middle where I feel there are some ethical problems and theological problems with the application of AI. That's very interesting. I'm so glad that you were willing to talk about that. I just read a couple months ago John Dyer's book, People of the Screen, which is an Oxford title. I was actually skeptical of some of his conclusions, maybe because I work at Logos, but one, one concept that stuck with me was what he called HEP, hopeful, 
entrepreneurial pragmatism. He said that American evangelicals are well described by that little acronym, and I think he's exactly right. And I think HEP folks would look at AI and say, yes, this is our magic bullet. We can get this work done much more quickly. And you know, there's something to be said for that American can-do spirit. I appreciate it. It's one reason I am doing this channel, because I was so despairing when I wrote a Bible textbook. And and I won't give all the details, but um, a, a vocal minority of customers insisted that if you don't use the King James, we won't buy any of your materials. And I thought, these, these folks are holding hostage children. And, and, and I'm, I'm hamstrung. I have my hand tied behind my back as a Bible teacher because I'm forced to paraphrase rather than quote in certain places where I know there are false friends that'll be misleading. I thought, what do I do? Well, I'm going to do something about it. I'm glad Americans are, but we've got to have smart people like you who are going to come along and say, let's slow down a little bit and let's discipline and refine that pragmatism. Keep the hope, keep the entrepreneurialism, but we've got to make sure that we're not actually undercutting the overall purpose here. Reiner Bois, this has been super fascinating for me. I think this will be very interesting for my viewers. Um, I've got a lot of Bible nerds out there, folks who are very interested in picking up the insight that linguistics can provide into their Bible interpretation. And I think you've helped us take several more steps along that line. Thank you so much for the time that you spent with us. It was a great pleasure. You're most welcome.